So I first met EJ in 2009, about an hour before he presented his piece for our Pugialis Fellowship competition, during which he performed a work in which he methodically epilated himself. The first of many works that I've seen in which he presents his queer black body as the site of performance. That performance signaled a singular sensibility, and it also won him that Pugialis Award. Over the next couple of years, I watched the progression of his work with anticipation and enthusiasm, and I was delighted when he was accepted upon graduating from Columbia into the graduate program at UCLA. When Industry of the Ordinary, the collaboration of which I am one half, proposed a young performer series in conjunction with our show at the Chicago Cultural Center in 2012. My working partner, Matthew Wilson, and I immediately agreed that EJ's was to be the first name on that young performer's list. The subsequent proposal for that performance in which EJ and Colin Pressler were to occupy a bed in the window of the Cultural Center facing outwards publicly onto Randolph Street for 24 hours almost caused us to close the entire exhibition down as members of the upper administration of the city of Chicago having nothing to do with the Cultural Center but actually in City Hall when they read our proposal including EJ's work they felt that this proposal was too potentially inflammatory, even suggesting that the public would throw bricks through that window in protest. We stuck to our guns, believing strongly in EJ's intentions for the work, and the city backed down. The piece itself was brave, beautiful, and tender, and I think that EJ is Oh, no, he's not going to show examples of that, but you can see it both on Industry of the Ordinary's website and on his website. In the years since then, EJ has gone from strength to strength with many exhibitions, awards, and residencies. Most recently, an endurance work at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles as part of the Made in LA show, for which he stood on a podium in the museum all day, every day, for three months and for which he received the Public Recognition Award from the Hammer. That's enough from me. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to welcome my colleague and friend, E.J. Hill, back to Columbia. Thank you, first, uh, to Amy and Adam for inviting me here, come back to Columbia and talk about my work and share some ideas and things that I've done and thoughts that I have with all of you. It's really, I'm super nervous, I'll say. Only, like, I've, I've done this, I've done this several times over the last few years, but I was telling Adam and Amy earlier that this one is particularly special because it kind of feels like, I mean, this is where it all started, really. And so it kind of, coming back kind of feels like almost like, you know, making, like making your family proud or something, you know? It, it, it like has that kind of feeling. And to see so many former professors out in the audience is like really wild. So uh, I'm gonna try not to let my Cancer Sun Scorpio Moon like get me, get me all tender up here. But as you know, some of you know, I'm a pretty, pretty watery, sensitive baby. So, you know, I, I, I thought that this would be a good place to start because, uh, you know, everybody loves a good origin story, right? My Peter Parker moment was in Maine in like 2005, maybe. 2000, yeah, 2004, 2005. Shortly after graduating from high school, I got the opportunity to work at a summer camp in Maine and the director at the camp at the end of the summer was like, hey, I think we're going to start an arts education center for our older campers. And they were about 15, 16 year olds, all coming from the state of Maine, all economically disadvantaged. It was a tuition free place for these kids to just be kids for the summer. And when the director proposed this, I was like, I don't, I don't know anything about art. I don't really like art. 
I don't know why me. He's like, oh, you'll be fine. So the next summer, I met this woman, Margaret Nomentana, who was extremely pivotal in my development, super influential. She ran this week-long drawing workshop, and I was her assistant. It was like a pilot program to see how we, what we were going to do the following summer once the arts education camp was up and running. And so I worked with her for that week, and at the end of the week, she sat me down and basically told me that I should go to art school. And so I kind of fought her on it, again, because I didn't really have any art background, no experience in art. And she essentially maybe just saw something in me that I didn't recognize that I had. So later, a few months after I went back home, she sent me an email of schools, art schools and colleges and universities with art programs that I should look into, and Columbia was one of them. And I should say that Columbia really, in all honesty, I chose Columbia. You know, I thought about it long and hard. At that point, I had worked every terrible job imaginable for little to no pay, and I couldn't see the rest of my life in some kind of gray space, middle zone, where I was just unhappy working for small checks for basically nothing. So I was like, maybe, maybe college could be for me. Maybe art school could be a thing that, that I could do. So I took a gamble. And Columbia, as I said, I applied because it was literally, it's the only school that would take me. I didn't have the, the high school grades. I didn't take the ACT or SAT test. Columbia's open admissions policy, super, like, just generous. You know, I didn't really have to jump through the hoops. A lot of my peers were jumping through after high school, so I got here because it was the only place that would have me. This is, in a lot of ways, the first work I've ever made. When I was with Margaret that week, just black squares, she told me to cut just once and then arrange on a piece of paper, and that's it. So, your boy at Columbia, uh, <laughs> this is... Just like walking in front of the building and seeing people smoking out there, I was like, that, like all these memories kept coming back. Um, but I got to Columbia in the fall of 2007, so over 10 years ago now, which is wild to think about. And pretty immediately fell into a group of students who inspired me and challenged me and frustrated the hell out of me, but most importantly, they, they kept me like sane, you know? They loved me. We loved each other, and it was this really beautiful, shared experience with other, other young artists who were curious about making and curious about looking. And they, yeah, they just kind of they just kind of held me up in, in 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 a lot of ways that I really needed at that time. Transitioning from not having gone to college to immediately landing in Chicago and having this pretty surreal experience. Karen Bavinich, Nina Mayer, Tanner Veach, Jesus Mejia, Meredith Weber, Anna Trier, all of these people, Josh Minkus were just like really 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 grounding in a way, and we just made art and laughed and drank beer and hung out together. And they, at the time, so that this photo, Before Cake, After Dinner, was this sort of group that developed over or via shared interests of performance and sculpture and installation and things that we were just kind of obsessing about. So it wasn't totally uncommon for us, some of our arguments, to really just be about art, which looking back at it is just kind of funny that we get so good about stuff that like, I won't say it doesn't matter, because obviously it matters, and that's why I'm here. But we get so heated about looking back, things that I think it's just testament to the fact that we we're really passionate about what we we're doing and what we we're learning. So around that time, I was introduced to the work of Chris Burden, an artist from, or it was living in LA, uh, uh, an LA staple, performance, monumental sculpture, um, and I really connected with a lot of the things that Burden produced. 
For instance, this is his MFA thesis piece from UC Irvine, a performance in which he basically just locked himself in a locker for five days. And there was a five gallon water jug in the locker above him and then an empty five gallon jug below for you know, bodily, bodily fluids. Marina Bramovich and Ule, a lot of their collaborative work also, you know, I'm coming to art school again thinking that I'm gonna learn how to render things realistically, and <laughs> like, which I did, which I did learn, uh, by the way. But I, my, my, my view of art was quite limited at the time, and so I'm coming here and being introduced to things like this, where this performance they have, they're sitting back to back with their head, with their hair tied together for 17 hours total. The first 16 hours, just them in the room, and then the 17th hour was open to the public. So by that time, you know the hair is like wild, and their shoulders are slouched, and the posture, their postures are sagging. But I'm coming into art school and learning about this stuff for the first time, and it just kind of rocked my world in a really important way. This work I come back to maybe twice a year and read an interview. They did this interview with this publication called High Performance. Linda Montano and Taishing Shea did a one-year performance where they tied themselves together with an eight-foot rope and never touched each other for the whole year. And they lived like that together for a year. This was mind blowing. This still is mind blowing to me. You know, this is something that I I didn't realize at the time, but would really sit so deeply within me, and then just come up so often as I'm trying to figure out my own relationship to art making. This this like I mean a whole year tied like they tied themselves together for a year. You know, that's not anybody. So. Now we're, going to get in, now we're going to get into some stuff that I did here. And I usually don't show this work because it, 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 you know, it's largely experimental. I was figuring out my own art language. Nothing felt really cemented back then. Things really still don't feel very cemented. But I thought it was important to show here because much of what I'm doing now, a lot of what my, folk, or what my practice is grounded on is looking back at my educational experiences and my, yeah, my presence in, in school, essentially. So I'm thinking of this, of course, in the context of an academic institution and students and faculty. And uh, so I'm going to show a lot of student work from back then, mostly performance stuff. But this, <coughs> Margaret McNulty and performed a 10-hour work around the city of Chicago where I was blindfolded for the first five hours and she declined to speak. And after five hours of running errands and walking around Chicago and going to get lunch and everything we had to do that day, we switched roles. And for the next five hours, I was the silent one and she was the blindfolded one. This was in a performance class with Matt Wilson. And at this time, I'm thinking of just, you know, we're learning a lot about the body and what the body is, what it does, and how it functions, and how it relates to the world, and how we relate to it. And so I started conducting my own experiments with the body. And for this, I just opened my mouth and bowed my head and just tried to see how long it would take for my saliva to pool in my lap, which was only about like three minutes. But I sat like that for a good 10. And I, I was looking at this photo. I haven't seen a lot of this stuff in years. So it was funny to go back to these images and see that the person behind me is kind of just like, I can't with him, you know? <laughs> He's like shielding her face. I mean, it's a pretty visceral thing to watch. Someone just gazing at their crotch with their mouth open and salivating into their, into their laps. So this was about a 10 minute. And then, you know, it's art school, so you like force your peers to watch this stuff. Uh, and then you talk about it. <laughs> what, what I realized in looking back, a lot of what I was doing, I think, was just having people deal with my body. 
you know? Like, my presence, I think, not I think, my presence is coded and packed with meaning, and this was something that I was learning while I was here because my body, <clears throat> oh, okay, a quick aside, I'm from LA, I was here for school, and LA has its own problems for sure in terms of class and race and how the city is divided and people are in different neighborhoods, but I had never experienced something as stark until I moved to Chicago. It was pretty early on where I, I realized without having to look up, if I was riding the red line south, I would know when I was nearing Harrison and I would know when we've passed Harrison based on who was on that train. And this was, this was kind of jarring for me and I, and I didn't quite know how to deal with that. So as I'm in class, and we're learning about the body, we're learning about performance, and, and, and artists who are dealing with body as material, I had to go out of here and then deal with that. Like, I, ha I had to still be a person in the world, so I'm coming back to class, not totally having a whole lot of examples on artists who look like me dealing with body, with their body in this way, and trying to contend, contend with what it means to exist in this body making art with my primary material being this body. So I think looking back on all of this stuff, I was creating situations for my peers and teachers and passers-by to just be like, now you have to deal with me, you know? Like I'm here inserting myself into your world, into the situation in a way that is unfamiliar, that might be a little uncomfortable and we're gonna see what happens when we, when we deal with this together. So for this performance, I essentially locked myself in the trunk of my car and placed the key on the bumper, the same key that could be used to start the car and drive away. Without a word, just walked the class down from, I believe, the fourth floor, got to the parking lot, hopped in the trunk, and closed it from the inside and just wanted to see what happened. Luckily, Mark Fisher, who's in the back, kind of panicked and let me out like pretty early on. But this work, again, thinking primarily about body as material, but getting closer to understanding the coded language, the coded languages of my body in particular. I had this sketch in a book of a vacuum and a blow dryer. And I, and, and I looked at this drawing for like weeks, thinking what goes between this? You know, I'm thinking about how they're, they're these objects that deal with air in a very specific way, opposite ways. They're kind of, you know, yin and yang to one another. Uh, and then I had this eureka moment of like, place body here, you know, insert here. And so I stuck the blow dryer in my mouth, turned it on, and then the vacuum also on with the hose attachment inserted into my rear hole. Art school, right? Like, um, <laughs> like, what, like what, what else do I say? I think, so a, a, a lot of what's happening here too is, is, a, is a particular kind of exhaustion and violence that, that I think wasn't originating for me. I was like maybe kind of reflecting back out into the world. What's not seen here is me choking and gagging on the hot air that's being forced into my throat faster than I can breathe. And so you walk into this room, there's a blow dryer on, there's a vacuum on, and that noise is just so aggressive. And I learned pretty early on that I, I, I prefer still photography video to document my work because it allows people to insert themselves in a way where video often more often than not, people use it as like a one-to-one -one translation of, oh, I saw what happened on the video. I watched it from beginning to end. And so I think photos offer a little bit of space, maybe. This work, I walked a roll of black duct tape across Madison as it intersects state, which is where North Chicago meets South Chicago, and titled it, This is an Imaginary Border. 
So again, really just pointed ways to, to begin articulating what I was feeling outside of these rooms. Because again, the friends that I had and this environment here, I mean, it felt pretty safe. I don't know, safe like psychologically, emotionally, it was a testing ground. And then I had to go out into the world and deal with people who probably, not probably, but people who definitely didn't always have my best interests in mind. Um, so that's another detail. I think this day I actually had to talk myself out of getting arrested because a cop was like, what are you doing? I was like, making art. He's like, uh, no, you're not. Le legally, th there was something like, this was in the public way. I can't remember the legal jargon, but 2010, this is my mm, junior year. The first year of the Acre residency, I, I, was a, I was a resident at Acre, and as we're driving into Wisconsin from Chicago, uh, or driving into Boscobel, the town that Acre, the town that the residency's in, there's this huge banner welcome you, welcoming you to Boscobel, and then also these billboards that are like, hey, come down to next weekend's Civil War reenactment. Uh, it'll be great. Welcome to Boscobel. Like, the Civil War was dope, right? Let's, let's cosplay. <laughs> and so I'm coming in having to deal with whatever this experience is going to be, and so I went to the Civil War reenactment. Because I thought about it, and I couldn't shake it, and I couldn't really be a participant in the residency until I dealt with whatever this was. So I went down, scoped it out, was in like a suit and tie, basically a dress shirt, a tie, and like a little American flag pin on, the, on my shirt, and went to the Confederate camp and dragged my body across the Confederate lawn where they're all like, I don't know, eating soup or whatever. And using only my arms, so dead weight from the shoulders down and just dragging my body through the Confederate camp at this uh, Muskets and Memories Civil War era reenactment. So this work, everything's a little out of order, uh, but I wanted to show this after all of that because I think any second years out here, anybody undergrads, I think this is, I see you, okay. This is your year. I think now you're eligible to apply for the Pugialis Award. And I can't stress enough, apply to everything you're eligible to apply for, every single thing. No matter what it is, if it's like a $2 prize, zero prize, what, like, whether you want the thing or not, just apply. Because the people who are on the panels and reviewing these applications, like these are the people who make up the world that hopefully if, should you choose to participate in, these are the people that are there. And you never know what kind of happens after that. And Issa Rae says this really interesting thing about networking that I really love. She says she figured out long ago that she wasn't interested in networking up, but rather networking across. Because I think it, I think it, it gets it's easy to think like, oh shit, like this curator of this place or this professor or someone who's like above you, you're trying to like aim for to scoop you up and bring you into the clouds where it's like that scene in Hook where they're all eating, you know, this like lavish dinner. That's pretty easy to get seduced by. However, there have been so many people alongside me this entire time. None of this ever gets done alone. I've never done a single second of any of this by myself. There have always been people beside me, in front of me, behind me, around me, and, and showing that image that I started with, with the group of us, that's, like, those are your people. The people sitting next to you, it's not the curators, it's not the director of this, and, like, faculty love you to death, but, like, it's, you know, it's your peers. Like, that's who's really going to, like, be there for you. So I'm showing this work here because the Pugialis Award was the spark that I needed to sort of understand that these investigations, these experiments that I was conducting, did have some weight to it, and that people were responding, and people were looking and thinking, and, and wanting to engage further 
with the ideas that I was developing. And it was a, a fire that got lit and and hasn't, you know, hasn't really died down yet, which I'm really fortunate, I'm really lucky to say. As Adam mentioned, I shaved my entire body from head to toe, and the resulting work was just a pile of hair with clippers on the floor in the studio. The gallery, sorry. The gallery where Shop Columbia is currently. Even eyebrows, everything went. The only thing I stayed were the eyelashes because, I mean, what do you want from me, you know? <laughs> and I thought this would be cool to include, but this was the, the very first artist statement I've ever had to write, and it's the artist statement for that work. So I'll just give you a second to check that out. I told you, Cancer Sun, Scorpio Moon. She's a feeler. All right. Everybody good? Need a second? Yeah? Great. Okay, so around the time of graduating, I graduated in 2011, and right before that, there was a show at the, the Art Institute shortly after the Modern Ring opened. I think it was a collection show, maybe. Walk you know, just going through the museum, and I turn this corner, walk into this dark room with this video projected by this artist, Andrea Frazier. And the video was official welcome. It's like a 30-minute video from 2001 of a performance that was performed between 2001 and 2003. This video is from 2001. And I'm only gonna show, it's 30 minutes. We won't obviously watch the whole thing. I'll, I'll, I'll show just a few seconds from different points in it that I think are pretty key. Um, of course, these kinds of introductions are among the rituals of, of recognition and incorporation that so much of my work has been about. That's pretty low name. Does it sound okay? Like it's low. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to totally try to figure it out now. She, it's this speech that she gives, thanking people for bringing her out to show the work. And then throughout the course of this 30 minute official welcome, she moves through different personas of the artist, the gallerist, the curator, the museum director, the critic, the arts writer, and move and embodies these people and then slowly disrobes. And by the end, she's completely nude and crying. The whole thing is bizarre. And I, I'm watching this and entering this room, and I, I waited to catch the loop where I started, watched it a full time, and then came back a few days later and was just kind of like, it, it had been a while since I just like happened into an artwork like that. So after researching her and her work, I learned that she was a professor at UCLA, and then learned that the, the program that she was teaching in new genres within the, within the art department uh, the New Genres program was actually started by Chris Burden in the 80s. So 
these two artists that I, that I was feeling really connected to and inspired by were in my hometown of Los Angeles. So after Columbia, I hightailed it back to LA. And this was on one of my visits, one of my visits to UCLA to check out the school. I got to check, I got to see an undergrad juried exhibition and this artist, Rafa Esparza, who current, like one of my nearest and dearest friends now, at this point I had no idea who this person was. There was a sculpture that was sitting in the middle of the room wrapped in fabric and the opening was about three hours. Toward the end of the opening, the guy that you see here, Timo Fowler, sat on the floor, played this really somber song on a radio and then started pulling at part of the fabric which started to rotate the sculpture to unravel and reveal that Rafa had been in there the whole time. And so when the fabric got to the end, it was tied to ropes which were pierced into the tops of, uh, into Rafa's chest and Timo gave one big pull and these hooks, it's like, uh, I can hear everyone's responses. That, that's exactly how I felt in the room. I, you can see I'm right there in the yellow jacket. But so I, I figured if Andrea Frazier is teaching here, Chris Burden start the program, and this is what like the undergrads are doing, I want to be here so badly. So I didn't really want to go to grad school, per se. I wanted to go to UCLA, and I wanted to be there, and I wanted to be among that energy, and I just wanted to keep going. I had the momentum, didn't want to stop. So I'm going to give you a second to read this. I, you, I've been putting this slide up first at the lectures that I do, before the title, before my name, before the date, and before introductions and all of that, I'll leave it up and then I won't say a word about it throughout the, throughout the, the rest of the lecture. So it's usually just become something that people read while they're filling in the seats. But I think I'm going to highlight it here only because it provides context for the rest of the presentation. Come back to it later, if need be. UCLA was, my, my time at UCLA was super fraught. It was one of the most traumatic experiences of my life. I'm going to put that out there. It was very difficult, and not for any of the ways that I thought it would be. I thought grad school was, I knew it was going to be difficult. I was anticipating it being very challenging, but I thought in terms of workload or you know critical discourse and just the type of rigor that comes with graduate level education. And yes, it was all of that, but mostly, you know, I, I came I came from this school, I came from Columbia, <clears throat> which felt really supportive and like closely knit. I had my people, I had my friends, everyone we were it was basically a big warm group hug for four years. I got to UCLA and this, you know, dirty word that you might have heard a few times called the market reared its, I, won't, I, don't, I can't say ugly head, it reared its head. So, like, I've been thinking about how much I want to talk about this because I do understand school is school and I understand the position of wanting to shelter young artists from the, like, some of the harsh weird, bizarre realities of this thing as a profession, but I want to speak honestly to you students. Art as like a job, a full-time job, can sometimes get 
Like it, 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 it there, are a lot, there are a lot of different ways to be an artist. There are so many different ways to be an artist. The, the way that I choose to run this whole thing and the, the circle that I've found myself in is the gallery, museum, curator, collector, biennial type artist, which is just one way. It's one way out of so many different ways to do this thing. When I got to UCLA, collectors and money and donors and all of that stuff was like, it was in my studio and it was the part of the culture and it, it, it started doing really nasty things to how people were treating each other in this environment. So that said, I was using performance as a way to ground myself in this new reality, in, 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 in the reality of no longer being able to experiment within a safe academic environment, but making work in a community of peers that were really invested in commercial gallery exhibitions and selling out their studios at Open Studio. And it kind of tore me up. So, my first performance that I did that I, when I got to UCLA was a sort of space claiming, where I licked all the walls in the gallery as a way to just insert myself in this space, leave my mark quite literally. After a few minutes, my tongue was rubbed raw and started to bleed. So if you can imagine walking into the context of a group exhibition of your peers, and there's just a trail of blood around every single wall, You'd imagine it not sitting too well with the administration, the faculty, my peers. This landed me in hot water, and I continued to be in hot water for the rest of my time at UCLA because I was using my work to examine what it meant to be invited into this space and trying to grapple with what it, what it was to be so public and so closely tied to some of the wealthiest people in Los Angeles. And this was when I was learning that art and money are oftentimes some of the most complicated bedfellows. And we're, I'm gonna start breezing through a lot of this stuff because I always, overshoot with images. But I do want to talk about the, a few more works at UCLA because I'm working with Andrea Fraser at this time whose entire practice is examining the structure of art and not just art as visuals but who holds the power in these, in these circumstances. Because really artists, you know, I'm sure you've, you've heard this spoken here, but like without artists, there would be no art world. Like we make the stuff, right? We make the stuff for people to put in museums, put on walls and go look at. Artists make and then everything else gets built around that. What I learned when I moved back to Los Angeles was that there are a lot of very, very powerful people, white males with money. And this isn't just in art, this is, this is the structure of the world that we live in. And art is just one of these like many, many, these many worlds where power is completely imbalanced. And I'm just here, you know, little sensitive old me, trying to make art in this. So this work <clears throat> was an MFA preview show where, uh, you know, my ambivalence towards being on the inside of this now. I'm no longer on the inside. I'm at one of the top institutions, uh, MFA institutions in, in the country, and I'm being like welcomed into this world and not really knowing how to deal with it. So at one of the openings, I hold the doors shut after champagne toast for donors. And so the only way to get out of the gallery for this show to get more wine and champagne is to fight me, basically, at the threshold. And so this was a, a private, private opening with the public reception happening just an hour after. And this was totally new to me. I didn't know that this was common practice for a lot of exhibitions. 
having a private opening only for a very important select few, and none of those people really included any of my friends. So I couldn't invite family, I couldn't invite my friends, I just had to like, you know, dance around for people with money for the program. Uh, it's not all a bummer, I promise. I'm gonna lighten up here. <sighs> Started making paintings after grad school because who needs to be sad about all this stuff all the time? I've found that painting, painting has come into my practice in terms of, or in times of upheaval kind of, when things are feeling a little heavy, <clears throat> a little overwhelming. This is the first suite of paintings I made shortly after grad school. As I said, it was a really tough time. And then again in 2015, made another suite of paintings and they're all brightly colored, saccharine, abstract works that on the surface are completely void of any meaning. But since I'm here, and I'm gonna tell you, these works on the second layer, so the second suite I made in 2015, when I was having trouble leaving my apartment after the highly public murders of black people by police. I was afraid to leave my house, so what I did was I hold myself up for almost like a solid two weeks, just coming out when I needed to for like groceries and stuff, and just painted, just got lost in bright colors, amorphous shapes, and that, I've found that painting has sort of become the, the meditative space into which I enter after using my body in these ways. And when I say using my body, I don't necessarily mean in performances, I mean just being out here, you know? Being present. Whoa. All right, I'm gonna skip some of this stuff. Uh, so these are the paintings from 2015. And the names are of people who were either murdered or accosted, assaulted by police uh, from that time. This marks a huge shift in my practice. First, Sabina Ott, thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you've done. For me, my peers and students over the years, Rest easy, beautiful soul. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This work that was a part of the Terrain Biennial. <clears throat> I didn't think I was gonna do this tonight. <laughs> Uh, the Terrain Biennial in 2015. Just give me a sec. <laughs> give me a second. I was invited to participate in the Terrain Biennial in 2015. And the work that I made, the work that was developed with the help of Adam Brooks, Industry of the Ordinary, and Victor Yanez Lascano, another peer, Columbia alum. Because I'm starting to move into structures and objects and, and sites for performances. So no longer is it only about my body or the queer body, the black body, but I'm, I'm starting to open up the work for other, other experiences and other people who may feel invisible or insignificant for them to work out what they need to work out. So I'm, I'm interested at this point in sort of becoming a channel. And so this work was a lemonade stand where lemonade would be dispersed for free at different intervals throughout the biennial. And 
the people who would receive the lemonade would get handed a card with this text on one side. So there's, there's, there's tremendous importance in airing your shit, right? We could go about leaving everything on the inside, or, or we could let people know. Because if we're not letting people know of our experience, we might miss the other person who might need their own reminder of their own power and fortitude and that they are actually important. So it's not just to like teach people who might hold positions within society that are above our own, but it's for, again, it's like networking across. It's to remind others that like, we've got this. We've been had this. Wow, okay, there's so many more things left, and we're at about an hour. I'm gonna go with like maybe 15 more minutes before we open the questions, is that okay? Everybody hanging in? Maybe need to stretch or uh, high five your neighbor or something, I don't know. <laughs> Did I hear a high five? <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> so good, oh my god, okay. So from, from the Lemonade Stand, this platform, making sculpture. Like I have a year at the Studio Museum, this residency in New York, which completely changed the game for me. Where UCLA almost killed me, and the Studio Museum saved my life. I, it was the first time I had the, the amount of space, time, and resources to think big and so ambitiously. So what ended up happening is I made 40 foot long roller coaster with neon tubing, LED neon flex. And then at the end is a platform on which I lied for three and a half months. So the whole run of the show, I was on that platform all hours that the museum was open. And I think I'm you know, bringing back this endurance and struggle and performance in all the ways that, that are meaningful and interesting to me but expanding them into basically pedestals and, again, sites for performances, platforms, things that elevate and raise up in, in, in a way to kind of highlight, yeah, importance. You want someone to look at something within the context of art. You want something to regard, someone to regard something highly, one of those tried and true art history, you know, one-on-one -on -one ways, put it on a pedestal. And so I started making really big, elaborate pedestals. I'm not going to talk about this, but a lot of this. Oh, this is, this is kind of major. This is one of my first attempts at filling a room with discrete works and different objects that kind of complete a whole. So I'm thinking about these in terms of albums. The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill is my favorite album ever. And so I think of all of these things as like tracks and interludes that comprise the whole. So it's an installation, but they're, they're, separate, they're separate musings on like life, love, and learning. Everything that I make is concerned with one of the three, if not all of the above. So this whole show, the whole premise was, again, uplift, you know? Raise it up. I just said raise it up, like, my like, grandma would say that or something. So you could walk on the platform in the show. Shout out Solange Knowles. And this was sort of the anchor point of that exhibition that kind of tied everything together. and. When I use we and us and our in a lot of my text works, whether essays or neon text pieces, it's very important that I make it clear I'm, I'm not using a universal we. I'm not talking about everyone. I'm talking specifically to and speaking for 
the us and the we that have continued to feel pushed aside, disregarded. And my, my we is quite specific. And my we oftentimes is black and is queer, but I have to consciously remind myself or I have to be aware that I'm also a cisgendered man, you know? Like, I hold power in a certain way within societal structures that I have to be very conscious of and, and intentional in how I move through space, how I occupy space, and how I'm making room for other bodies and other experiences. So when I say we, I'm speaking from a very particular we that I hope can allow for your we to butt up against my we, and we can figure out how to make this shit a little bit better for all of capital U, us. The swing in the middle was like a gallery bench, so you could sit on it and look at the painting, or you could look at the neon and swing. This work, I got to show at the Venice Biennale. You know, like what, I, when I left here, when I left UCLA, all of these things that have been happening the past few years, I thought I would have to wait an entire lifetime for, if they happened, you know? The, the way things have been going recently, are, they're so surreal, and I'm so grateful that I get to, that I get to do this and work full time as an artist, but again, in, in a little bout of honesty, it's not just, I can't stress it enough, it's not just me, it's not just me. There are a whole team of people helping me do this. I am the face of this thing. I don't want to call it a machine, maybe an operation, maybe like a, a movement. I, I get to be up here speaking to you today, but there are so many people my friends, dear friends of mine, who help frame, print, transport, work, they just, they, they make it all happen. And I, and, I, and I don't want anyone in here to leave here tonight thinking like, man, like, I can just become an artist if, if, if I just like work hard and maybe go to the right programs and meet the right people. Like, I think, again, there's so many ways to do this, but keep your people close. Keep everybody with you the whole way. That's, I can't stress that enough. I got to make a two and a half story tall roller coaster out of wood. And at a certain point, I was just in the way for the people, the team who was constructing it. Which is difficult for me, because I, I want to make this stuff. The performance element of this was standing on the pillar for, or it's titled pillar, but standing on the roller coaster or pedestal or column or pillar for three days, six hours straight each. It's collaborator Peter Tomka, collaborator Jamal Tolbert. And just to give you a sense of how tall it actually is, those are three men on the, the lowest part is like eye level, the tallest part is like two and a half stories. So it was really dangerous, but um, shout out Fupu. I'm gonna breeze through some of this stuff because I really want to talk about this. I want to I wanna end with this. The most recent work that I made was an installation of photographs and sculptures and an another neon text piece that was a meditation and musing on all of my years within educational institutions, going back to the blurb that we read by Nico Dacumas about what happens when all of these people from so many different walks of life are in a room together. Diversity and inclusion, it's great, you know? I'm not ever gonna say that like that's a bad thing, but it's only the first step in a long series of steps on dismantling oppressive social structures. It's not enough to just get different bodies in the room. I'm far more interested in what happens once we get there. And I've been really fortunate, again, to have experiences where I, I, I can sort of like travel in and out of different social spaces, different, whether that's 
race or gender or even class. In this work, I ran around every school that I attended in Los Angeles, similarly to how I shaved my entire body. It's a, it's a shedding, it's a letting go, it's an exercising out of all of the things that I no longer need so that I can continue to move forward. So I ran what I called victory laps around each school. This was a high school that I went to. This was like a six mile run in 90 degree weather. That was at the end of the run. Collaborated with photographer Texas Isaiah, brilliant maker, to create these, these gorgeous images that lined the perimeter of the gallery. And again, pedestal, platform, sculpture, whatever you want to call it, I call it altar. I stood on for nine hours a day, six days a week, without breaks for food, without bathroom breaks, without ever stepping down once from June 2nd to September 3rd. So this just ended three weeks ago. It was one of the most transformative experiences that I've ever had. I can't even begin to describe what happened on that altar, what I went through, how my mind and body changed. But now I can let go of all of that stuff. You know, I worked it all out. Like, the hang-ups that I had, my UCLA experience, I've had, I had professors come in, see me, and immediately walk out. I had some friends at UCLA who I've reconnected to because of this. You know, we get pulled away for different reasons, but this was such a beautiful experience. I don't even know, I can't really say much else about this work. It's also way too fresh in my head. Again, that's, you know, your people. Keep your people close. That's Rafa, the person who was sort of one of the catalysts for me deciding to go to UCLA, was there on the last day when I stepped down from the podium and just like sobbed in his arms. Is this familiar to anybody? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I told you I learned how to render realistically. I just, I, I'm pretty sure this is the last slide. I, I think it is. But I just, I want to I wanna end again with first like a huge, huge thank you to Amy and Adam for the invitation. Joan, my God, Joan, thank you. Duncan, thank you. I know Annika's in here somewhere. Anna, I, like, I, I can't, Joanne, like, you know, there, there are people here. I, I don't want to forget anybody. This feels like an Oscar speech. When they're going <laughs> to gonna start playing the music, and then... But uh, this, this time that I had here was so formative, and it continues, continues to be something that I hold in my memory bank in, in, in a way that... I mean, maybe it was timing, I don't know what it was, but I can't ever divorce myself of my experience at Columbia. If there's anything that I can leave you with today, students specifically, this isn't impossible. It's, it's difficult, it's challenging, and there are people that you're gonna meet along the way who are gonna make it even more so, challenging in ways that you can't anticipate ever. It's going to be so hard, but I promise you it's not going to be impossible. It's not impossible, okay? Just keep that, keep going for whatever you want, whether that's to be a gallery museum artist or to be, or to not even work in art at all. I don't know what you want, I don't know what your ambitions are, but the people that are going to help you realize these ambitions are sitting right next to you. They're your roommates, they're the people you eat lunch with, and just, just keep them. Keep them and keep challenging each other. It's gonna be hard, but I promise, I promise, I promise. <laughs> Thank you.